der Weizen ist geerntet, die Kürbisse reif und die Bäume hängen voller Äpfel. Wie kommen all diese Produkte nun vom Landwirt zu uns EndverbraucherInnen? Auf dem Großmarkt werden überregional nach Qualitätsstandards die Produkte verschiedener Landwirte angeboten. Dabei wechseln relativ einfach große Mengen auf einen Schlag den Eigentümer. Die Beziehung zu den Endkunden ist anonym, was dazu führt, dass vor allem die Ware im Vordergrund steht. Die EndkundInnen wählen einfach das Produkt nach Aussehen und achten vor allem auf die Qualität. Daher wird nur Ware angenommen, die Qualitätsstandards entspricht, was zu großen Mengen Ausschuss führen kann. Die Waren legen teilweise lange Strecken zurück. Die Produkte werden von Zwischenhändlern weiterverkauft und der Gewinn auf alle aufgeteilt, die an der Wertschöpfung beteiligt sind. Ein Beispiel. Von den 3 bis 4 Pound für das Mehl bekommt nicht nur der Landwirt, sondern auch die Mühle, der Betreiber des Großmarktes, Zwischenhändler, Transportunternehmen, Supermärkte und weitere etwas ab. Die Vermarktung kann auch direkt erfolgen, ganz ohne Zwischenhändler. A lot of people come here. And some people do come and collect and those are my best customers. Hier wird eine persönliche Verbindung zu Kundinnen aufgebaut. Da weniger Standards die Qualität sichern, wird auf das Vertrauen der Kundinnen gebaut. Es gibt verschiedene mögliche Konzepte. Sie sind davon abhängig, wo der Hof liegt, wie viele Mitarbeiter er sich leisten kann und welche und wie viele verschiedene Produkte angeboten werden können. Um mehr KundInnen anzulocken, ist eine vielfältige Produktpalette von Vorteil. Auf unserer Reise haben wir unterschiedliche Möglichkeiten der Direktvermarktung kennenlernen dürfen. Fred erzählt uns, Uh, my outlets, so I, I've got an honesty stall, which is open 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, I do pubs, restaurants, uh, cafes, uh, other farm shops, uh, on other box schemes as well. Because I also do, which I didn't tell you, about the pick your own. That's a new scheme, I love it. Uh, I've been doing that for five years now. Uh, people come and pick their own vegetables. They bring their own bags, sometimes bring their own fork and spades. They harvest their own vegetables, they go to my office, put it on the scale, look at the chart, put the money down and go home. <laughs> so at the end of the, some Saturdays, I've got 15 families turning up with little kids and dogs and I go, yep. You give them an introduction, not to step on the, where to go, what not to do. I put good markers out and sometimes I put flags out for the kids of what's the best pumpkin or uh, beans to pick. And the kids love it, and the, the parents as well, because the kids are running around and the, kids, the parents have a bit of peace and quiet. But, and they go home with, you know, they spend quite a bit of money. The kids, they start eating carrots because they've dug them themselves. And last year, it, it, we don't differentiate between the pick your own and the honesty stall. But last year, it was 15,000 pounds just from pick your own and the honesty stall. Einen Honesty Store, zu deutsch bekannt als Selbstbedienerladen, findet man in vielen ländlichen Gebieten am Straßenrand. Sie haben 24 Stunden, sieben Tage die Woche geöffnet. LandwirtInnen oder ihre Angestellten stellen die frisch geernteten Produkte in den Stand. Die Kunden bedienen sich selber und werfen das Geld in eine ausliegende Kasse. Anders als bei Pick Your Own fällt für den Hof also mehr Erntearbeit an, Dafür wird niemand für das Kassieren benötigt. Wie ehrlich sind die Menschen beim Bezahlen im Honesty Store? Hattest du jemals Probleme damit? It gets worse, I think. Yes. Uh, year, oh, sorry, day on day, well, week on week. We keep a record of what we put out, how much comes in. Uh, normally it's about 90%. Sometimes it's 80%. Uh, but never, not often that it is below 80% is being paid for. Uh, but again, I, sell, I tell people, because it's less cash, they, could, they can do bank transfers. In the first year, I had 6,000 pounds on the bank. bank. People do tra bank transfers, great. Yeah. Uh, but I sell, tell people, keep your own tab. So know how much you put in. Some people put 20 pounds in and they just have a little, I don't know how they do it, but they just keep taking the vets and they until they think they've done the 20 pounds and then they put another 20 pounds in. So it's hard to keep track of exactly 
how it works. I don't have a camera. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to. Uh, if it comes anywhere below 70, 60 percent being paid for, I might have to think again. Yeah. But now, I mean, the cost, honestly, I get a few potatoes, paper bag, two pounds. You know, I've got no expensive packaging, uh, no marketing, or, or yeah, it's, it's so much easier. I set my own price, uh, people love it. So, yeah, long may it continue. No, I, I couldn't, you couldn't afford to have someone there. And if you just open at specific times, that's why one of the reasons why the, the, the two women that tried it failed, because they came in at eight o'clock, had a coffee, started up setting the stall up, you know, by 10 o'clock it was all set up, had another coffee, and then by four o'clock they would start taking everything away again. And then five o'clock they went home. The first thing I did when I was all on my own, I thought, well, okay, 24 seven open, uh, yeah. You can't be spending time moving it in and out. Uh, it's wasting. And a lot of people come after five o'clock. There's light on there now, so people always have access to light and to whatever vegetable there is. And people know that whatever vegetable is out there is picked that day, is fresh. And that is, uh, that's a big bonus. Bei klassischen Hofläden betreut und verkauft Personal im Laden. Der soziale Kontakt kann für manche Menschen ein Argument sein, dort einzukaufen. Wer einkaufen geht, möchte nicht für jede Gemüsesorte einen anderen Hof aufsuchen. Daher ist für diese Wege der Direktvermarktung wichtig, viele verschiedene Produkte anzubieten. So macht es Fred. 10 Hectares uh, grow 30 different kinds of vegetables, 100 different varieties. Uh, it's all seasonal and it gives me the diversity to supply people. Wie kann ein Betrieb diverse Produkte anbieten, die Wertschöpfung vor Ort umsetzen und Gewinne erwirtschaften? Neue Wege bieten Risiken. Deswegen rät uns Fred. Practices of how you cultivate or whatever you grow, it is so much better to do it in, in gradual stages. Don't go all of a sudden crazy for one kind of vegetables or one variety or one cultivation of one kind. You know, always take it slowly, it implement whatever change very slowly, say 10 15 percent a year. Um, yeah. So that made us think about um, how we could change the system to make it more integrated and more sustainable. Um, what we first started off doing is just carrying on how they'd done it before to see how that would work. So for example, in 2020, when our first season here, um, we grew wheat and we milled flour in our flour mill and we sold the flour. And we also paid young people to pick cherries from the trees. Um, and we lost a lot of money because um, people in this country won't pay enough money for their food, for cherries, for example. Yeah, I suspect it's the same in Germany. They will only pay, even though these were the most beautiful, organic, perfect, lovely fruit, um, we still lost money. So it was very clear, particularly on this small scale, that that was not sustainable. So what we have looked at is two concepts. One of them is short food chains. And the other is enterprise stacking. So short food chains means that we don't sell flour to a company who sells flour to a supermarket, who sells flour to a baker, who sells, makes bread and sells baker to a customer. We have a bakery here which makes bread with our flour. So that's a short food chain. But they also integrate into that all of the fruit. So the women in the bakery, and you'll meet Henrietta in a, shortly, um, they are part-time fruit picking, part-time baking. So we never sell cherries or we never sell apples as raw products. It's apple juice or dried apples or apple cakes or cherry pies or do you see what I mean? So short food chains. And go as a farmer, become a bit more clever than most farmers nowadays. Conquer your position in the chain. So when we buy our food at, at supermarkets, which many people do, and you pay for your food, 
on average, only 10% goes to the farmer. And there are other costs involved, which must be paid for as well, but also other profits involved, which are bigger than the farmer's share. And if you shorten the chain, you get a more fair price. And this is not that I say it should be all community supported agriculture. This cannot be on this size. There should be a, a smaller system with customers coming and picking themselves, etc. Then you have a sh very short chain and a very good price for the farmer and involvement of the, of the neighborhood. Here we already have an agreement with a, uh, a catering company. And they said, we want to pay you the price of wholesale organic, which is roughly 50% of the share, which is fair enough, I guess. And then we made calculations for what, what for red currants, for apples, uh, for nashi pear, apfelbiene, uh, which, and they all come out if we even pay a fair price to pickers we have to hire uh, without exploiting, which is also happening in sometimes in agriculture, but, going, uh, but just a fair price. But also um, enterprise stacking. So each of those is a, a like a business. So the bakery is a separate business to us. The vegetable growers who you will meet are a separate business to us. We have a woman called Faye who is based in this corner here, who is a, a craft person. So she is using the bark and the leaves and the roots to do natural dyeing and wood carving. So she has a separate business. We have some people who are doing willow weaving, making furniture and baskets and things like that. We have a woman who looks after bees. We have another woman who is growing hemp. They are all separate enterprises based here. So short food chains and enterprise stacking is what has enabled us to make it sustainable. We hope that we will make our money by people paying to come here. So, so for us, we earn our money by renting out the farmhouse and the pods, mm -hmm. um, and that brings us the income to cover the, the other costs. But each of the separate businesses is sustainable in its own terms. The eight people who work here growing and baking and so on are financially mm -hmm. independent, if you like. But for us to pay for the costs of the infrastructure, yeah. we have to have visitors. Der Gemüseanbau wird in einer eigenständigen Community Supported Agriculture, kurz CSA, oder zu Deutsch einer solidarischen Landwirtschaft, kurz Solavi, organisiert. Eine Solavi baut auf dem Vertrauen der KundInnen auf. Dazu werden die Ernteanteile noch vor dem ersten Spatenstich verkauft. Nachdem der Betrieb eine ausreichende Anzahl an Leuten gefunden hat, die bereits vor der Bestellung der Felder einen Anteil bezahlen, ist das finanzielle Risiko der Organisation gedeckt. Bei der Ernte wird der entsprechende Anteil dann den jeweiligen Menschen zugewiesen. Preis und Größe des Anteils ergeben sich auch aus Fruchtbarkeit und Flächengröße der Anbaufläche. So hat der Betrieb bereits die Mittel, um das bewirtschaftende Personal für die Fläche zu bezahlen. David nennt sich hier Wedge Growers. The veg, veg Growers, they yeah. give us three thirty-fifths of their produce uh -huh. to nine percent of their yeah cabbages or 9% of their tomatoes or whatever um, and actually probably what we more, mostly do with that is we give that to Henrietta in the bakery and she cooks with it. Um, selling craft products, yeah. she gives us a few hours a week of her time. Um, uh, with Henrietta in the bakery uh, we are on a profit share with her mm -hmm. so it, each relationship is different. We have to compensate for our scale yeah. problem in other ways. Um, uh, I hope that in, let's say, five years' time, it will be financially and operationally independent and sustainable. I think if you had a bigger farm, yeah. not a problem at all. Warum das kein Problem wäre, dazu kommen wir später im Film, wenn es um das Thema Subventionen geht. Zunächst möchten wir wissen, wie das Konzept bei Wakelands gedacht ist und welche Ökosystemleistungen sie neben der Ökonomie und Essensproduktion noch beachten. Wir wollen den Betrieb besser verstehen und wie die anderen Bereiche den Hof ergänzen. Traditionally here, they were looking at improving their farming techniques. We are interested in how the land and how the farm is um, uh, important, not just for producing an income, money, <laughs> not just for producing food, but also for tackling climate change, for sequestering carbon, for improving the biodiversity, for reducing pollution, but also for education, for employment, for accommodation, for housing, 
uh, for well-being, a whole range of other things. So we are very interested in being part of a bigger conversation about how the land is functioning, um, returning in a sense, because this is obviously how it used to be, to being much more at the centre of community, making people much more aware of where their food comes from and so on. So we are very interested in visitors and events. So this weekend, for example, we had an apple day yesterday with 230 people from the area who came to help pick apples and do apple, make apple juice and learn and do and have a nice time and visit and see. And we're very keen to have visitors and groups um, and people staying here to diversify those things. And obviously all of that also helps with our financial and operational sustainability. Einen großen Unterschied gibt es bei einjährigen und mehrjährigen Pflanzen. Wenn der Input in die einjährigen Pflanzen gemacht wurde, müssen sie dieses Jahr geerntet werden. Bei mehrjährigen Pflanzen sieht es laut Voter von Egg anders aus. If you don't get a good price, don't pick it. Then you have no cost. So only pick where you get a good price for. Voter lässt die Bäume nicht schneiden. In Wakeland sind Kosten für die Bewirtschaftung vorhanden, wie uns David erläutert. Well, so as agroforestry, we spend quite a lot of money on um, uh, two guys who uh, we call them arborists, who manage the trees. Okay, well, you wouldn't have that on a conventional farm, so that's an agroforestry cost. Yeah. Voter vergleicht seine Polykultur, also die landwirtschaftliche Praxis, wo mehr als eine Pflanzenart gleichzeitig auf demselben Raum angebaut wird und die natürliche Vielfalt natürlicher Ökosysteme versucht wird nachzuahmen, mit der konventionellen Monokultur seines Nachbarn. Ja, yeah. and, and all those external inputs are needed over there, because it's monoculture, so they have to spray. Uh, they are very afraid over here for a, a frost late in spring. And I have a system which is expensive to invest in, uh, to spray around water to avoid frost damage at the end of April. We sometimes have such a frost, and this is, yeah, it's a pity. Then we don't have that much apples. But we have a polyculture system. So each year, some crops fail, and some are exaggerating in the amount of harvest. And the average is fine. And for the trees, for one year not having to produce apples, for them it's sabbatical. They grow and develop well and have strong uh, sucus in their cambium in uh, uh, instead of in the fruits. And the next year their harvest will be above average. So that's, that's how things settle out in the polyculture system. I mean, our costs for farming are low um, because we don't have all the chemicals to spray. So our next door neighbor, Uh, he spent the whole weekend driving up and down that 400 hectare field, massive field, with a sprayer. So huge costs in the chemicals, huge costs in the diesel, very expensive tractor. His yields might be higher, but his costs are very high, and particularly now, the cost of fertilizer incredibly high because they're very energy intensive to produce. The price of his uh, outputs hasn't gone up very much, but the price of his inputs, the diesel and the, and the fertilizer, costs have gone right up. The one big change in system is, you have seen the neighbor field. And each year again, fertilization is needed, plowing is needed, big machines are needed, hours of, they are often rented, uh, fossil fuels are needed, uh, pesticides are needed. And then at the end, it's back to zero, the empty area again. When you have designed and planted your food forest system, it's zero external input. You don't have to pay for big machines, for fertilization, for pesticides, for fossil fuels. So for a company, it's very nice to don't have to pay bills. Then there's a gap, a few years, no harvest, seven years. Then the harvest starts and it starts a bit slow. And then like a good pandemic, It's exponential, exponential growth. In this case, this is fine. Uh, and we now, sometimes I nicknamed ourselves, Peter and me being the laziest farms, farmers of the Netherlands, since we let nature do the job and we do not do all those things. What I was talking about, the stacked enterprises and all these other aspects, I think, I think they are um, synergistic, um, in the sense that we are doing things that we think make sense environmentally and socially and whatever, but they also make sense financially. 
because you, we think we can make this work sustainably. We think you can make agroforestry farms work sustainably in a way that conventional farms I don't think can. In der EU bekommen die landwirtschaftlichen Flächeneigentümer und Flächeneigentümerinnen pro Flächeneinheit einen Förderbeitrag aus der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik. Dadurch, dass die LandwirtInnen mit großen Flächen genügend Geld für ihre Flächen bekommen haben und ihren Lebensstandard decken können, können sie die Ernte für kleines Geld weiterverkaufen. Kleine Farmen sehen dort Probleme. Because, um, people in Europe don't pay enough for their food. I mean, our, in this country, um, food has never been cheaper than it is now in terms of um, uh, people's, the, the amount of people's income that they spend on food is the lowest it's ever been. That's why I said the whole food system is broken mm -hmm. because you know, a few decades ago uh, people spent 50% of their income, disposable income, on food. Now it's less than 8%. You know, so all of a sudden food isn't valued as more uh, anymore. It's just people don't think about food anymore. Yeah, mad. And it's mostly, it's not because, so people, but they, but it's not because farmers make money on um, from agriculture, they make money from subsidies. So, so, so the average, so we are cereal farmers, wheat farmers really here in this area, so my neighbour, um, the average UK cereal farmer has an income, a personal income of £70,000, okay? Mm -hmm. That's as if he was doing a job, okay? But of that £72,000, the profit from agriculture is only £2,000. The rest is either subsidies or it's using their buildings for something else, like storing stuff or what we call diversification. So farmers do not make money from farming. <laughs> I'm sure it's the same in Germany. So our problem is that this is not big enough. So here, our subsidy from the government, it's, it's the EU calculation, it's about £100 an acre. Mm -hmm. So we get £5,000 a year from the government. It used to be £5,000 from the EU. He gets, he has a big farm, he gets 150000 from the from the government, so he makes a, he can live on 150,000. You couldn't live on 5,000. So the, this is the subsidy thing. So as I as I think I said, um, immediately after Brexit, we had a we had a, a minister who was not a farmer, who was going to pay farmers to plant trees. Now we have a minister who is a farmer, and they've abandoned that idea. It's getting better, but it's still you know, yeah. it's still it's still not fun. It's not bringing about fundamental change. I don't think. Okay. In den Niederlanden hat Voter mit seiner Organisation einen Durchbruch erlangt. In future, yes, but they lack behind. Uh, uh, but we reached with uh, our foundation an agreement with the ministry that every farmer doing creating a food forest system according to the basic principles, well, uh, its dominance of food producing trees. It's having a layering with, apart from the trees, three other vegetation layers. You know, we can count up to till seven or nine, but that's not needed. Uh, if you don't use uh, fertilization anymore and don't spray pesticides and don't uh, plow your soil, you get funded like every other farmer for a hectare of uh, farming land, which is a, a breakthrough uh, for having also for the farmers, so even they get this funding in the years without production and without having costs, which is nice for filling the gap in between. But the return of biodiversity, the improvement of water management, uh, the, the cleaning up of the environment and sequestering of carbon still are not paid. Mike ist begeistert und hat andere Finanzierungsmöglichkeiten neben den Subventionen für die Pflanzung seines Agroforst gefunden. It's fantastic, I really love it. Yeah. Of all the projects I've done in farming for the last 40 years, I think agroforestry is, is my favorite project. This was part funded by as an environmental scheme. So it's paid for by the government, basically. A lot of this. They pay for the trees. Um, and this is recreation of a traditional orchard for its biodiversity and um, and partially for nature uh, which I mean, if you heard that charity charity that looks after trees here in the UK and supplies trees and and um, they basically put an advert in a magazine saying they were looking for projects um, 
to fund. And um, basically it was um, carbon offsetting by one of the big hotel chains. And basically they wanted to buy trees and plant them. You know, so in this country, our climate, um, government climate agency says that we need to have um, a third, we need to plant a lot more trees. And the only way to plant those trees either is to do big forests, which they don't want to do, or to have a third of the country, a third of England in agroforestry like this by 2050. And that's just for sequestering carbon, just to sequester carbon. But also it's bringing other, um, other benefits. I think, I think um, uh, that's why I'm interested in moving away from measuring farm outputs just on the farmer's income um, or just on the wheat yield or whatever. So this piece of land here, 50, uh, 23 hectares, we have eight people making a living, okay? He has a thousand hectares, he has two people, okay? So in terms of employment, but that's not, a, they, that's not what they measure. What they measure is how many tonnes of wheat or how much money. But if you measure how much carbon you sequester, or how much biodiversity you have, or how many great crested newts you have, or how many people you employ, I think the calculation becomes much more interesting. So we need to move away from a very narrow measurement of far, what, we, what we expect from this land to say, here's a whole range of other parameters that we get. Education and mental health and housing and employment and climate change and yeah, that, that would be my proper, that's why I think agroforestry, organic agroforestry can make a contribution. They should uh, support farmers shifting from animal cultivation and from fodder production uh, to perennial systems and planting trees. And there is a gap before the trees give real harvests. Uh, if you make an agreement that the trees are going to be planted, that they will be there for at least 40 or 50 years, uh, and pay the farmer the missing income for the first five or seven years. That would be nice, that would be supportive. Große Mengen eines Produktes lassen sich bereits jetzt anonym über den Großmarkt vertreiben. Wenn die Landwirtschaft über die Produktion von Lebensmitteln noch weitere Funktionen wie Schaffung von Biodiversität, CO2-Speicherung, Wasserreinigung, Schaffung von lokalen Arbeitsplätzen und soziale Teilhabe erfüllen soll, dann empfiehlt es sich, die Subvention für diesen Weg freizumachen.